Well, thank you very much for asking me to speak today on engaging clients and families in the patient safety agenda. Uh, I wanted to start off by saying a very big thanks to Laura Williams and Heather Evans and um, Lily Yang, who a lot of this work, um, in fact, almost 100% of it uh, comes from them. So a very big thank you to them for allowing me to use uh, uh, some of their presentation today. So just a little bit about who we are at um, Holland Blair View. We are Canada's largest pediatric rehab facility. Um, we are fully affiliated with the University of Toronto. And just to give you an idea of how many visits and children we see um, each year, is we tend to see about 7,000 uh, children with about 600 inpatient admissions and roughly uh, 58,000 outpatient visits per year. Uh, I think at uh, Holland Blair View, a key organizational value is client and family-centered care, and it's embedded throughout our hospital within the inpatient, day patients, and outpatient programs. Uh, it's certainly one that uh, I believe if you were to ask our staff here at the hospital that uh, we really do work on the understanding that family plays a vital role in ensuring the health and well-being of their family members and it's also one that's mutually beneficial um, with the healthcare providers, the children, the youth um, and their families as well. Why is this such an important um, issue now in terms of including families within um, patient safety's agenda. If we look at the current climate, um, especially at the new Excellent Care for All Act, uh, and it's founded on the basis that, um, that health care is um, obviously has a high quality. And within that, we want to make sure that it is patient-centered, population health focused, um, and of course, something that means a lot to me, one that is safe. Uh, within our quality improvement plan at Holland Blair View, um, we have uh, included in one of our pillars um, patient-centered. And I think to be patient-centered, you have to truly include the families um, within committees um, and embed their opinions on services that are being provided. So just where we are at with family leadership programs here at Holland Blair View, we do have, um, I believe it's actually a little bit higher now, but we do have um, 32 family leaders that are registered here at, uh, at the hospital. And we have family leaders placed on more than 20 committees um, throughout the hospital. One of the uh, more interesting and I think um, valuable stats is that this is roughly works out to about 428 hours of um, volunteer hours that our family has put in, which works out to roughly 12 weeks. Some of the work that our families have been included on include our Clean Hands Protect Lives campaign. Uh, they've done a lot of work with complaints and issue resolution, as well as um, work around our documentation change committee. And this is a committee that I'm a part of as well. And it was really interesting at uh, our last committee meeting, we had a family member sitting in with us that actually came with, um, with uh, a background in banking. And she was able to make a lot of links between what we were trying to change and some changes that had recently gone on at the bank where she is employed. And it was very interesting to get the family's perspective on on what we can be doing in healthcare and try and mimic some of those things that may be happening in other industries that, uh, that are valuable for us. We're also looking at um, having a family member included on the Med Reconciliation Committee. In fact, just this week I've had uh, a family member that wants to sit on and a client that wants to sit on our Med Reconciliation Committee. And I think this is really important because I've been sitting on this committee now for four years and we've been trying to develop this form and this process to try and get med reconciliation uh, embedded into practice here within the hospital. And one of our biggest struggles has been form development doesn't make sense to the families. And we've drafted probably about 20 versions that we think make sense, but yet it's obviously time to include the family's opinion and really hear from families whether or not um, the med reconciliation tool is uh, one that works for them. We've also had um, a big interest in our pain education fact sheet, 
we've had four family members that have stepped forward that uh, were not happy with um, pain management within the hospital and wanted to make sure that other families don't have to go through what they've gone through in terms of advocating for uh, proper pain management within within the hospital. So they've come forward and now are going to be working with our pain steering committee uh, to develop a pain education fact sheet, which is invaluable for us here at the hospital to get that opinion from what families are looking for. In terms of, um, of implementing family leadership within the hospital, from a staff perspective, we obviously need the support of senior leadership and also wanted to formalize practice related to family engagement. We didn't want to haphazardly just put family members onto committees. So with this, this was something that Laura Williams had taken a big role in, in terms of screening families and interviewing families and talking to committees on how families would fit in, um, having family members call the chairs of the committees or a representative from the committees to ensure that, that families were the right fit. Uh, we do try to look for a minimum of two family advisors per, com uh, per committee and also allow, allow for multiple methods of engagement while on um, the committees. So how does the family member fit in? What's going to be their role within the committee? Uh, we also want to look at transparency while the family is sitting on the committee. And I'll talk about that a little bit later when we look at some of the concerns from from. Uh, staff members of having family members on committee. But we do know that transparency um, really is essential for creating an environment of trust. And we do know that the perfect time is to engage families um, is right now. So some of the concerns and questions from staff at the committee level included privacy and confidentiality. So what information can be shared? Uh, it really I think forced us to really look at how we're presenting information. Um, we obviously should be looking to protect client identity and client information um, at all times, regardless of whether family members are there or not. So it, it kind of changed the way we look at the way we present our information at committee member at uh, committee meetings. Um, how do we know if we have the right fit um, with the family? And that comes out from each committee meeting, and I haven't heard of any family members dropping off of committees, um, and I haven't heard of any staff asking to have a family member taken off of a committee for any reason. Um, another concern was, what if the family is just there to complain about an issue? Uh, again, like I had mentioned before about the work that Laura puts into um, placing the family members on the committee, um, it's a joint relationship. So um, I've, n I've never been at a committee meeting where a family member has, has just complained about a specific issue. Um, I found that uh, they come with a very objective opinion as to what it is in the hospital that families are looking for. And can family members provide insight without expertise? Uh, and I mean, from what I've seen at the, the committees that I sit on, um, absolutely. In fact, sometimes I would even recommend it because it's a fresh look at something that we maybe have been dealing with for years and not been able to solve certain issues or move forward with certain initiatives. And sometimes it is that family member that comes, for example, um, at the change document, the documentation change committee, um, having somebody coming in from a bank uh, with the bank expertise and saying, well, have we thought about this, actually provides a lot of insight for, for us in healthcare. Um, and then what about including clients on the committee? So we've already taken this to the next to the next level, and it's not just family members. It's actually what about having some children sit on, on the committees? And we've actually had some children say that they want to be included, um, which actually just happened this week for me, that a child wants to sit on our Med Reconciliation Committee, which I think is, is fantastic. So from the family perspective, how can we best support our families in committee work? Uh, one of the big things that we can do is provide documentation in advance to those families so they can come prepared. I mean, we know as staff members we don't like to show up to meetings unprepared, and we should be providing the same respect to our family members and ensuring that they have the agenda and any attachments or um, 
any anything that needs to be read beforehand. Um, introduce who is at the committee and explain their role. That's one of the biggest things that we have to remember is that the family members may not know who we are and what we do within the hospital. So it is important to do those introductions and make sure that the family member feels welcomed into the committee. Uh, we want to ensure that the family voice is recognized uh, and valued as a part of the team. So it's not sort of, you know, you talk to everybody and then ask the family member at the very end, do you have anything you want to add? Um, we want them to feel comfortable voicing their opinions within the meeting. Um, obviously, follow up and provide feedback um, is important. And actually, a lot of our family members seek feedback. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say things like, how did I do? Is that okay? Did I say the right thing? Did I say the wrong thing? Um, I've always kind of been in the frame of mind, you can't really say um, the wrong thing. It just makes us think maybe a different way. Uh, remember that families don't have the inside scoop um, when it comes to the hospital and to some of the initiatives and to some of the background to it. So making sure that we do get our family members up to speed with some of our committees, as a lot of the committees that we have within the hospital have been running for years and years and years. Um, trying to schedule the meetings that work for families. Um, so uh, we do try to look at everybody else's schedule within the hospital, and we have to be mindful of, of their schedules as well. What I've seen, though, is that families want to be heard. They want to come to these committee meetings. So. Sometimes they join by phone, and I'm sure video conference as well um, could be an option uh, for certain um, family members and committees. Uh, we obviously want to provide training for the, for the family members, as it actually may be a brand new experience for them to sit on a committee. They may have no experience of sitting down um, at a table with a group of, of people and having these meaningful discussions around practice improvements or whatever the committee's um, mandate is. And we want to remove any barriers to participation. So once the family member is on the committee, looking at how we can engage them fully within that committee. So these were some of the quotes that I was reading actually while I was preparing this presentation that I thought, uh, I feel bad for these guys. Um, the first one is, there's no reason why anyone would want to have a computer in their home. And that was uh, said by the founder of Digital Equipment Corp. in 1977. So it only obviously knows what's going on now with uh, home computers. And people will get tired of staring into a plywood box every night. Um, that was said by the head of 20th Century Fox in 1946. And we know what people do with their time in the evenings nowadays. So I just think in the not so distant future for healthcare, um, I certainly wouldn't want to be attached um, to a quote like, families have no place providing input into the care or service they receive in healthcare. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, they can certainly feel free to um, email me or call me, and I would be happy to provide more information on what we're doing here at Holland Blairview. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. That is really very helpful, and I especially zeroed in on, uh, on some of those uh, best practices or tips on, um, on how to make this a success for involving patients or clients and, and their families. And we'll get back to asking a few questions of your presentation towards the end. If people are listening and just jotting them down, we'll have the Q&A section sort of uh, as we, uh, after we hear Hope and Heather's presentation just now. So that's really great, and, uh, and thanks again for that really thought-provoking presentation. Thank you. So at this point, I'm going to turn over the presentation control to Heather McCready and Hope Chick from the Solar Children's Hospital in Alberta. So um, uh, Heather is the coordinator of the family room at Solary, and uh, she's worked with uh, many staff, families, and physicians around the development of family-centered care. Um, and Hope is a clinical nurse specialist, also at the Solary, and her focus is on quality improvement and patient safety. And key to this role is the opportunity to work with families to ensure their voice and experience are reflected in that work that she does. So um, over to you, Hope and Heather. Great. Thanks very much. Um, this is Heather speaking, and we're going to be going back and forth in our presentation between myself and Hope. So um, I'm just going to give a quick background about um, um, how our family-centered care network came to be. Uh, about two and a half years ago, the Stollery embarked on a formal commitment to family-centered care as one of the 
strategic priorities of the hospital. And since that time, I sort of call it an organic journey of engaging families because it's really grown over these past two years. And we've really um, been intentional about engaging families in the operations of the hospital, as well as looking at how can we grow in our skills and approaches in engaging family members as part of the healthcare team right at the bedside care. We now have, a, a, as you see in the diagram, a sort of an umbrella model of our family-centered care network. And we have over 150 members in that network, and that includes staff, families, senior leadership, and physicians. And uh, about 70 or 70 plus people are family members on that network. So there's three important components to the network, the Family-Centered Care Council, an NICU Family Advisory Care Team, which is a unit-specific group, and then family and staff members who are actively contributing from the sort of the umbrella network. This model seems to be sustainable, although we're still fairly early in our journey. Members can participate in formal groups or time-specific pro projects. That so there's members on the council and the NICU fact group, but also other family members on the network who are not involved in those two specific groups in different, different ways. To be a member of the network, um, it's, really, it's really open to everyone. Um, and we like to meet with people and talk to them about what are their personal interests and strengths that they're bringing to the, the network so that when we're looking at who is the appropriate uh, person to be involved in various actions and, and projects, then we have a way to refer back to a sort of a cataloged um, list of who's interested in what and also what skills they bring from their background experience that they've had. So all the members of the network receive a monthly newsletter as, as a way to keep them connected to all that's happening within family centered care at the hospital. And we also, through that, that method, make people aware of workshops and other volunteer opportunities for the families, the staff, the physicians, management to be involved in those various projects. So this is Hope speaking now. So I think that what is really interesting about conjoining of these two uh, presentations and being able to spin off uh, how Nick very eloquently described uh, the processes and the safety nets behind the scenes that help facilitate um, families being uh, welcomed into some of the, this committee work and uh, this working group. Um, participation that uh, is so valuable. And uh, we could actually take Nick's presentation and duplicate it um, to reflect the processes that we have in place, both with support of senior management and you know providing literature and backup to families prior to involvement in any of our uh, activities here at the Stollery. So thank you so much, Nick, for highlighting uh, how important those are. So, what we thought we would do is present three um, project-based uh, work that family members have been involved with here at the Stollery to highlight uh, the value added and, and how families can really bring us uh, to the right points at the right time. So uh, our first opportunity shortly after we started to develop the network and the council, um, a piece of work that was uh, being taken underway and was in the steering committee phase, our rapid response team. And so for some of you that were at CAFT last year, we did have a presentation there um, that demonstrated some of our work, but I'll just quickly go through. So in terms of the family participation in our rapid response team, key to our team is the ability for families to activate so they can make the call uh, just as easily as I, a staff member. Um, and, and that was a challenge for us at times. So it was really uh, a key to us to have the administrative support and leadership uh, here at the Stollery to uh, help back that voice up. And through the support of literature, um, we were able to actually support the family activation piece. And one of the items that uh, often comes out in terms of the family activation is, will families overactivate? Uh, will they activate inappropriately? To just uh, pull out a couple quotes. 
so when we look to the literature, the stats actually tell us that 1 to 2 percent of calls made to rapid response teams um, are actually uh, activated by family members. And to quote one of the uh, team members for our rapid response team, where we have absolutely uh, duplicated that 1 to 2 percent of our calls are family activated is that almost every, and this is a direct quote from her, almost every family activated call has resulted in a patient requiring an increased level of care. So we really have given the family members a voice and an opportunity to uh, sound the alarm if they think something is wrong with their child, so that gut instinct. So uh, in terms of participation in actually uh, the development of the team, uh, we were able to draw from the network and engage families on three key elements of building uh, and, and supporting the team uh, going forward at the steering level phase. One of those was key to the very first ground round presentation after the formulation of our council, where we had a family member co-present with the rapid response team physician to share her family story of how the team could have been activated, in quotes, when my gut told me something was wrong with my child, in support of both her family and the staff on the unit. So she shared a lot of uh, key elements that told us that not only did she feel that the team would have supported her, but would have supported the whole care team around her child. Uh, this was one of the first opportunities where family members were identified as key stakeholders in the policy and procedure. And I see, I see that as a, a really important point because we do indicate on our policy and procedure, the role of the family member. So who better to speak to that role and, and verify that we got it right than the family members. In terms of how we're going to educate families on the rapid response team, uh, we used family members to uh, help build the brochure that family members are given uh, on, on admission. And so this brochure uh, was provided to four family members, two of which had a, a background in education and uh, in terms of English as a second language. And this brochure outlines their role as members to the care team as well as how to activate the team. So um, they were able to tell us what was clear, what wasn't clear, and as one of the authors of the brochure, I can say that I accepted every edit that they, they sent to me. So it really did validate their uh, uh, involvement in the brochure. The one thing that we also did was is we went out to the community and we engaged in the community. And so as well as having four mem members review this internally, so from the council and the network, we took the brochure to the Multicultural Health Broker Co-op here in Edmonton, where it was translated into 10 different dialects, which were based on their statistics for interpretive services requested to the Scholarly Children's Hospital. Their process also included engagement of family members in the community to verify meaning in a double translation process. So they took our English brochure out to the, the various communities, translated it, for example, into Spanish, took it into a home of a Spanish-speaking family, uh, edited it for content, and then they actually translated it back to English to verify that they still maintained the meaning and the purpose of the brochure. And if anybody's interested in more information on the rapid response team, uh, if you go to the external Alber Alberta Health Services website, so just www.albertahealthservices.ca, and if you search rapid response team, you'll come up with a number of uh, newspaper articles, et cetera, outlining the success of the program. So our second example is around how families have been involved in uh, capital planning. And um, again, families have provided valuable input into the development and design of some of the different care areas here at the Stollery. We've had uh, one family member in particular who's been on uh, these committees that has an architectural background as an interior designer. And it, she's in, been involved in these projects and able to bridge the translation of floor, floor plans and architectural terminology to, to the rest of us. <laughs> And we've also gone to members of the network via email. And so now we have a group of family members from the network who we can send questions out to quite quickly with an expectation that they're able to respond within a few days. So that's nice when these projects move along so fast. 
we can get family response quite quickly, and they're able to identify various items that are really patient safety items in, um, in these projects. So an example of that was when we were looking at the emergency admission and triage area in the new pediatric emergency triage area. And this is a quote from a family who responded to one of those emails. Our daughter has both oxygen and a BiPAP machine. She has been admitted with pneumonia more times than I can count. We keep her at home as long as we can and try to keep her out of the hospital because she has spent so much time there. In order to bring her to the hospital, we have installed a power inverter into our van and must run the BiPAP and bring oxygen or run our concentrator. When we get to eMERGE, one of us must run her in and find a place to plug the machines in as quickly as possible while risking her levels dropping dangerously low. The biggest frustration we end up dealing with is finding a place to plug in and getting oxygen set up, with staff seeming shocked and not sure what they can do each time. We have long since learned where the plug-ins are and have had to sit in the waiting area for over an hour or two doing suction and running these machines. So that's their, that was uh, a very valuable um, piece of information because in the design at that time there hadn't been a lot of consideration around uh, plug-ins in the, the triage area. So it really brought not only that quote but many others really um, highlighted the importance of a family-centered approach in that triage area. And actually, we heard from the architects, architects and experienced it as well. They took a whole new approach when they heard some of these direct uh, experiences from families. So in terms of policy and procedure, um, here at the Stollery, we have uh, actually on our synopsis, so these are the, the forms that policy uh, makers have to fill in before they actually go ahead and submit a, a policy for a new policy or a policy for review. Family members are actually a standing stakeholder uh, on those initial forms. So from the very beginning of the policy and procedure process, we're actually highlighting the importance of using family members as stakeholders. So to date, family members have contributed as key stakeholders on at least six policies and procedure reviews. An example that stands out where family involvement changed the whole document was the NIC visitor policy. So through their involvement uh, in this work, it changed the tone from what you can do, cannot do, to welcome to our unit. The policy now identifies how family are an important part of the care of their child. Family members are encouraged, and this is a direct quote from the policy, to spend as much time helping us look after your baby as you are able while at the same time underlining patient safety. So an example of this is the importance of good hand hygiene and explaining why staff will be reminding them of the importance of washing their hands when they enter the care area. So they're actually getting this information up front and they're not feeling like somebody's um, bidding them or reprimanding them. They already know ahead that they're going to remind uh, family members as across the threshold of the sink at the entrance to the unit. So the body of the policy clearly states that they are not visitors, and in fact the word visitor is not included anywhere in the body of the policy. The document focuses on the safety of your child and how you as a family member and staff are a part of that. So some of the other policies that uh, we've also had stakeholder review from family members on uh, in include the ambulatory care um, operating room booking policy, the rapid response team, the NICU visitation policy, which I'm, I'm guessing we should actually change the name of that because they did that for us, um, the Alberta Health Services social media process, and as well as shortly before the um, family members were active uh, stakeholders in these reviews, there were a number of policies that went through that also identified the key role for family members in uh, the, the procedures of um, various uh, projects. And one of those was the, the role of the family member uh, in independent double checks. So when you're thinking about um, required organization practices and accreditation, um, we've actually included family members in some of that work as well. Uh, so. Yeah, so I'll pass it back to Heather. So 
we hope that uh, these examples are, are, are helpful. And for us, it's really highlighted the valuable role families play in ensuring safe delivery of, of care in our healthcare setting. And we've really learned that early involvement at all levels ensures we hear their voice at the right time and in the right place patient journey, which is not often a place we have been. And they highlight things we don't see. So um, I mean, we just recently uh, concluded an annual report of our family-centered care journey this past year, and we had over 295 uh, engagements of families in the operational level at the Stollery. So we're very encouraged by the work that families have done. Um, and uh, examples, if, if there's uh, time, but I also want to make sure there's time for question and answers. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. I think this morning we've had two really, um, really thought-provoking uh, uh, presentations and different perspectives, but actually speaking to the same point. And so I think that there's a lot to take away from it. I know that at CHIA we have a well-established um, family-centered care framework, and, and we work very much with our family forum. They're what I would call our number one partner. Um, but even in listening to these two presentations, I've taken away things and I sort of think, oh, God, I wonder if we do that, or boy, I wouldn't mind finding out more about something else. So um, thank you, everyone, for, the, for all three of you for your presentations this morning. Um, maybe before we get too far along, I might ask Lisa to um, let me know. I guess we can sort of throw out any questions as we have them. If you um, have the ability to, <coughs> sorry, choking there, um, to ask your questions through Lisa, that would be great. Uh, Lisa, how are we going to manage this? Well, uh, so far nobody has typed in any questions uh, uh, for me. I see a couple of hands raised, so I'm going to go to those people and see if they have any comments or questions. Hopefully they'll be able to unmute their lines. So, well, uh, Darlene Bolivar, our other co-chair, is, uh, is with us. Oh, great. Uh, Darlene, did you have any comments or questions? Um, it was delighted. I was delighted to hear the presentations. It's a lot of great work happening in patient and family-centered care across the country. I did have a, a question actually for Nick as he was going through and um, talking about it. And I'm just wondering um, if he can add a little bit about what are the decision points for what committees families are involved in, or is it all committees? And is there a distinction between an operations level um, and including patients and families and at the clinical level? Um, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, basically what, uh, what Laura Williams did uh, probably, I guess, now for the last, I would say, six to eight months is she actually comes to the committees herself and um, tell us about the program. Now, the committees that I'm on are both at the clinical level as well as at the organizational level um, as well. And Laura basically came to, um, again, I'm on about eight different committees, and I think she was at about six of them, um, talking about the family involvement and engagement within the committees, and then basically leaves it up to the committees to have a, a very robust discussion once she leaves about how we would see a family member fitting on that uh, committee. And I think once the committee level, at the committee level, once we discuss, I guess, how we see the privacy and confidentiality and the, the type of patient information that's discussed, um, all of the committees I've been on unanimously have wanted families on them to provide input. So um, I can't speak from Laura Williams' perspective and how, I guess, they actually formalize that process. But from my level at the committee, she's been at pretty much all of them. OK, thanks. So it's Tracy now. One of my questions that I would put out to Nick or perhaps Heather also is, how do you um, find the way to balance the time commitment that we're asking of families? Because I know that we have a lot of families that love to participate. But, um, you know, a lot of our committees obviously happen during the day, and, and their ability to get here is somewhat limited. I really liked the way, um, I think it was Hope who had spoken about different ways to bring in family input, either by, you know, hearing the patient's story or the, 
getting their input for education and so on, I guess a lot of creativity has to be used. But I thought, have you sort of tried to tackle that one head on about having getting their involvement? There's always a willingness, it seems, and on both sides, but how to actually manage it a bit more operationally. This is Heather. I can um, speak a bit to that. Um, it is always a, uh, a balancing act, and and you're right. Uh, families are very, very willing to be engaged, and and I think you know there is always that concern of burning people out. But I think um, you know I was just chatting, in fact, last night with the one family member who's attending the the uh, critical care expansion meetings and the design and development of that area. And uh, we were talking about engaging the other families. And we're very excited by the use of technology and email, uh, you know, not, not such a new technology, <laughs> but uh, to be able to use that sort of send out quick questions and get information back. And there's also another family member who is involved in many other things that's interested in attending these meetings. And she was saying, you know, why don't we um, invite her to attend where we can, and I'll keep in touch with her after each meeting uh, to share with her what's going on, so that she's kept in the loop, and I and that at least they have those discussions with one another. That if both of them can't attend the meeting, one of them can bring sort of their collective um, thoughts to the committee. So. Um, yeah, that networking with one another and getting enough people involved so it isn't just um, just one family member's perspective is is a is always something that we're looking at ways to do, and that's how we've done it. So we usually have one or two members on the committee so that it isn't just a sort of a heavy weight for one person to carry, and then we look at using inviting people from our network who might be interested in in um, providing answers to questions. And then we also, at key points, will take things to the council so that we have at least three ways to get input. Great. Nick, did you have any thoughts on that question? Uh, you know what? We look to have, uh, to have two family members on each of the committees um, as well. I mean, I think we're at the point in healthcare where families want to be heard. Families want their opinions to be taken seriously. Um, we do what we can, um, especially when we're educating the families around the certain committees that they're interested uh, interested in, is when they meet and seeing how flexible they can be around us. And I mean, I would have no problem moving a committee meeting to a different day if it meant, you know, that the committee can can move as a whole and include the family member in it as well. But I mean, we also have to use technology to our advantage. So. Um, I haven't used it yet in terms of something like video conferencing, if that was a possibility, if somebody was at their workplace, or, um, you know, teleconferences. I've been in um, in committee meetings where uh, the family members joined by phone. Great. Hi, um, Ray, it's Hope. Can I oh, just yeah. spin off of that, just what Nick was just saying? And I think that... Um, we are actually using telehealth. It's funny that he brought that up, so teleconferencing. So one of the co-chairs for our Family-Centered Care Council um, actually lives about an hour and a half, two hours away, depending on the season. And she actually chairs, uh, shares the chairing of the meetings uh, from the hospital in her home community. So we are using video conferencing and telephone conferencing for physicians who maybe can't attend the meeting. They call in and attend the meeting, but we are also chairing meetings during using uh, various technology. That's good. That that's like there's there's almost no excuse not to involve our patients and family. The um, uh, Lisa, are there any more questions out in uh, the world there, or can I ask another one? I have a question from Elaine Orvine. Okay, we can take hers. <laughs> I have, <laughs> thank you, Tracy. I, I actually have a, a, a few questions, and, and Tracy, I'll, I'll stop and hand, hand back to you, uh, and won't do them all at one time. I just want to say to, uh, to Heather and, and Hope and Nick, uh, just fantastic, fantastic content, and uh, as Tracy said, so thought-provoking and, and relevant. Um, specific to, to Heather and, and Hope, your presentation, what, just as a comment, very impressive in terms of a statistic that I, I think you said that of your 150 members um, of, of, of the sort of family-centered uh, family council, 
uh, 70 or families, and and the balance or sort of makeup of, of different different staff uh, staff members is is that correct? Is that a, am I quoting that correctly? Yes, in our family centered care network, that's correct. Yeah, we have 150 members, and 70 family members are uh, on that network. I just have to say that 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 really is is very very impressive and speaks to. Um, a, a very important culture and, and, and true commitment or, or walking the talk, if you will. So I, I just want to make that comment. I'm wondering, and, and I put this out to, um, uh, to Heather, Hope, and, and to Nick, um, we've, we've heard very clearly the success stories. And this is so important to everyone online, and, and I'm going to say to CAFC's entire um, community from coast to coast to coast. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe just think about one or two examples of where you had some real challenges that, that you obviously have overcome and maybe speak to how um, you, how, how you in fact resolve those issues? Because I'm certain that it's been a learning and a, and a journey along, you know, uh, for, for a number of years. Hi, Elaine. It's Hope. I think that one of the greatest challenges and, and possibly an area where we have a lot of room for improvement is gaining patience. Um, and in saying that, what I mean is that we're working on an agenda and a timetable and a deadline. And oftentimes, I find myself quite pressured in allowing for time for example, if we're using an educational brochure, you know, I have a timeline in place, yeah. um, and so I fan it out to family members, and I've really had to like sit back and take a breath and actually tell people who were telling me what my timeline was to advocate for family members in that our timeline is not their timeline, and that oftentimes we do have to uh, build some flexibility in in our agendas to afford uh, that opportunity. And I do think another uh, area that we, we need to work on and some, build some greater understanding is that um, our agendas are quite task-focused. So when we invite family members, um, I think that preparation of family members to be able to see that an agenda is an agenda and we're going to follow the agenda, and to improve our hosting skills in terms of we as staff members who have a set agenda um, and now have family members who come in who also bring you know, their family centeredness and their family voice to these agenda. So I think that in terms of trying to bring our two perspective of what a timeline looks like together will be key to the success of the work and building patience with each other is, is key uh, to helping get that move along. That, that, that's an absolutely fantastic point, um, Hope. And when I think about um, the family engagement that, that we have benefited from so greatly in, in, in various uh, CAFC committees, um, but I, I think that point you raise about our agenda is, or, or our timeline is not their timeline, it's not our family colleague timelines, I, that is such an important issue, and I know I, I personally struggle with it, and, and sometimes I'm going to say I'm not respectful enough of that issue. So I, I, I think that that's a really, really important comment. The, the only one other comment, Tracy, and I'm going to hand it back to you, and, and I'm sure others, other thoughts will come as we go. I, I was also um, really intrigued, um, I, I believe it was Heather and Hope who mentioned your entanglement policy. And it's sort of a question and comment I wanted to make um, back in, in the, the reason that we are all on this telephone and webinar together today um, really stems back to 2003 when it was the Stollery um, Children's Hospital that shared with CAFC's community a, a very openness and transparent sharing of a uh, of a of a very of a very of a terrible tragedy uh, around an IV strangulation of a little boy, and this happened back in 2000. And I just wondered, and and it was because of that sharing, because of 
CAFC's community coming together and, and working with Health Canada back at that time to actually change a guideline and a policy or recommendation that Health Canada had put out um, that our patient safety collaborative was established. And I'm just wondering if that entanglement policy dates that far back to sort of 2002-03 or, or is that a, um, something that, that's newer? So that entanglement policy that I'm speaking to actually uh, it, it's up for timely review. So it's looking at the policy that was deli delivered at the time frame that you're speaking to. Okay. And now just um, doing a, 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 a timely review of the material and the best practice and inviting family members in on that review so that they understand the importance of the work that's been done um, over the last, I guess, 11 years, if you will, um, around providing safety measures for infants who uh, actually do have a number of lines coming off of them, not necessarily IV lines, feeding tube lines, monitoring yeah. lines, etc. Uh, other, 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 uh, other, uh, uh, um, you know, absolutely. absolutely. Correct. So just a timely review. Yeah. Okay. That's that. That's excellent. And it's really. It. It, it was just. It was. I'm going to say very important to hear to hear that particular piece. Okay. So I have a question here. Um, there's people that might want to uh, contact uh, you, Hope, Heather, and Nick uh, directly. Um, is it okay if I share your email with them? Absolutely. Yeah, you're good to go with Hope and Heather's email. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Right. Not a problem. Great. Thank Nick, you. Nick, did you want to make a quick comment on, on any sort of challenges that, that come to mm -hmm. mind from Holland Bloorview's experience? Um, you know, I think, I mean, from, my, again, my perspective, Laura may have a very different perspective because she does a phenomenal job in um, interviewing the families and screening the families and really placing the families within the best um, committees suited to what their interests and their needs are and what the committee's interests and needs are. Um, the one thing that, uh, I, again, has been the biggest barrier, I think, from the committee level is really looking at that privacy and confidentiality issue. Um, we're a very small hospital. It's not too hard if we're discussing medication um, incidents. Um, we only have, you know, a couple of actual incidents a, a month um, and sometimes not even. Uh, it's really not hard to figure out who that uh, child or family was that something had happened to. So really trying to be creative with how we're sharing results around things, um, whereas before the family members were on the committee, I think um, we talked a little bit more freely. Um, we could use like initials when we were discussing, but that's all come to, uh, to a stop now and really starting to look at, say, medication incidents um, by their actual um, incident report number as opposed to initials and names and trying to be creative um, around that. But again, families want to be heard, so they are coming out to the committee meeting. Excellent, excellent. Um, I have one more question. We haven't quite run out of time yet. Um, and this would be for um, Hope and Heather. When you were uh, talking about bringing families in and you had uh, referenced the presentation um, at a Grand Rounds, I think, with a family member starting by sort of telling their story, and that is one that can be a challenge for some organizations on how to um, approach families to tell their story uh, or just to um, to even think about how to incorporate the story and yet the patient's or the family story is so impactful. We had a family member, we made the, the topic of our uh, board retreat was the quality and patient safety last year and we started it off by having a family member talk about his experience and he had a lot of experience with CHEO over a great number of years and so I'll tell you, that patient story put any number of PowerPoints to shame. Like, really, he basically told us all we really needed to hear. So I'm just really keen to see that you've actually done something similar, and I wonder how, um, what, how difficult that might have been to put in place or if you've uh, found you've ever had any challenges with trying to involve the family to tell their story. Hi, this is Heather. Um, this is one of the areas we've had really great success in, and um, one of the family members who we've contracted with has a 
great skill in coaching, I guess, families. And, and actually, you know, it's really amazing um, the skill that most of these families that, that have come forward saying they'd like to be able to share their story. I think the key thing is two pieces. Well, there's probably many pieces, but two that come to mind right now that are key. One is for the requesting staff or physician or whoever is hosting the rounds or the conference to really define what are the learning goals they want from that presentation. And then when we then approach the family member, they have a um, you know they have something to sort of work around because everyone's family story is huge and and all of it is important and powerful. But how can we bring it um, to focus on key messages. And so that's what we, we do, that's the support we provide for the families is, is tell us your whole story, but then if these are the key kind of learning goals, how can we uh, focus your experience around that? And um, the other thing we really like to do is be able to co-present with a staff or physician with with the family members. So in this instance with the rapid response team, um, we met, we had the family member meet the physician and one of the clinical nurse specialists. Oh, are you there? We lost you, Hope. Oh, oh dear. Well, that's disappointing. <sighs> yeah. Okay, well, for everybody else that's listening online, if um, Hope realizes, or Heather rather, realizes that she's not being heard <laughs> and can dial in. We'll certainly let her finish that. But I think her, her certain, uh, certainly I think her two main points that she was getting at was um, to co-present and have an opportunity to work with the clinician on the presentation. Um, and then certainly, and, and understanding the goals of the presentation. And then having some, uh, uh, even internal support with families around uh, supporting how that coaching might actually happen, um, maybe with somebody who's already presented their story before. So it's kind of an interesting angle, but I think one that in the patient safety forum would, is just, it has so much uh, ability to have impact that it's one that we should consider trying to find ways to facilitate and to do it more often. Um, seeing that we're running out of time, uh, if Heather jumps back in, great. We'll let her finish off her thought. And, but maybe I'll just take the last two or three minutes to um, wrap up a couple of things. But thank you, of course, first and foremost, to Heather, Hope, and to Nick for their presentations on involving pati uh, patients and their families in pa the patient safety agenda. So helpful, great way to start off our patient safety collaborative sessions this year. Um, and then to talk a little bit, just very so briefly, about the uh, CAFC Patient Safety Symposium that will be happening on Sunday, October 16th here in Ottawa in conjunction with the CAFC annual conference. Um, just wanted to do a little plug for you guys coming to Ottawa, but certainly for the uh, symposium in particular. And um, the, our guest speakers that day, that morning, will be uh, Dr. Ann Matlow uh, from Hospitals for Sick Children and Dr. Michael Gardham. So Ann will be presenting on results of the Canadian Pediatric Adverse Events Study. And you know that certainly CAFC had a large role in, in bringing that study to fruition and and has done some further work that will be uh, unveiled at the at the uh, symposium. And then uh, Dr. Michael Gardham, he has uh, worked very exclusively, uh, certainly here in Ontario, but quite across the country and worldwide, on on using uh, the technique of positive deviance and and help. And that's not some weird diagnosis. It's a really neat <laughs> technique on identifying um, where and how things could go wrong and being proactive about. Um, figuring out how we can actually uh, change these things by thinking through the processes in a lot of detail with the front line. So um, certainly uh, uh, Dr. Garden's presentation will be focusing on patient safety through frontline empowerment. So if you've ever wondered about how to engage your, your frontline front clinici clinicians and staff in the patient safety agenda, this is a presentation not to be missed. Um, so, if you are unable to make it to Ottawa, and I really do most sincerely hope you can, um, we do luckily have our next Patient Safety Collaborative Teleconference on November 25th. We welcome at any time your feedback around the, the, the current uh, session, but also any ideas that you might have moving forward on how we can uh, plan future agendas and really shape where the collaborative has come from. 
Um, I think it's great that uh, Elaine touched on actually what started the collaborative years ago, and um, now this is our opportunity to keep things moving forward in a meaningful and relevant way. Uh, Lisa and um, Elaine and Darlene, if you can get online, uh, are, do you have anything else you'd like to follow up with? No, Tracy. I, I just want to. I just want to say that it was. It was. It was so great just to take a second and and reflect and realize the impact that the folks online and so many others that have been a part of the patient safety collaborative have really had on moving the patient safety agenda uh, forward in Canada across our pediatric community and and the impact on our sharing of best practices and information very much like what we did today. So um, that, that for me was just one of the many benefits of, of today's call. And I am so looking forward to seeing everybody in just about 23 sleeps in Ottawa. So <laughs> thanks, Tracy. Okay, well then everybody have a, a great next month or so. Hopefully we'll see you in Ottawa. And if not, stay tuned for our call on November 25th. Thanks, all. Okay. okay. Thank you, Lisa. Bye-bye. That's Tracy. Thanks, Lisa, Elaine, and Tracy. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Darlene. Bye. I keep saying I'm going to do these calls from home where I know I, know I can uh, download whatever I need it. <laughs> For sure. Well, Hope and Heather got back on. <laughs> uh, really? We are Thanks. here, actually. Oh, yeah, they're we, there. Yeah, okay. we got disconnected, too. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah we did. did. And we almost, almost had a little bit of heart heart failure. Uh, heart failure at this end when we went blank for a few seconds. We had to <laughs> in. But Tracy, you kept going, so the uh, lines. Just, I didn't know we lost you guys too. Oh, okay. So that yeah. was good. Oh. Tracy, are you still on? Yeah. Yes. Um, Heather and I were just wondering if, because um, we're not sure at what point we got cut off. If I actually, was, I think you got most of it in. You, okay. had, you had wanted to follow up on two things, one which was um, uh, coaching of the families, and then the other one was around uh, involving the families um, ahead of time with the presenter to help plan the present presentation when you understood better the, the goals of the presentation. I think those right. were the two points, right? And then the final point is that uh, we don't end with just the prep work prior to um, preparing our families, we, we actually are present during the presentation, so somebody is always there, a face that they can look to. Good. As well as at the end of the presentation, we always, always, always debrief the family. So we go for coffee or tea or a muffin or whatever. Ah. What we have found from that is that, I mean, you know what it's like to present. There's always that emotional high, that adrenaline rush. And so it gives families an opportunity to share how they felt about the presentation and be reaffirmed that they met the, uh, the re requirements of the presentation or the theme of the presentation. And That's in the great. end, what it really does is it reinforces to those family members that they're supported throughout. And we actually, they want to keep presenting and they're looking for other opportunities to present. So um, that finishing off piece, I think, is also as important as the preparation. Well, thank you. And, and, of course, you didn't hear me say at the end that, like, for me, the patient story is one of the most impactful ways that we can actually start to really engage people in the patient safety agenda. You know, it's one thing to sort of hear about these things that happen third hand, but when you actually hear about the patient or family experience from their mouth, it, you know, it just goes so far. So I think that was one of my, the neatest things I took away from your presentation today. Thanks, yeah. So uh, just so everybody knows, I'm, I will share the emails. Uh, I will send out an email with the email addresses of our presenters. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. Congratulations. Congratulations. Bye. Bye.